It's great to see you again. Thank you. I don't think, uh, I think the last time we were together was at Michael Shermer's last spring. <laughs> a lot has happened since then, and uh, many people ask, and I would be remiss if I did not ask. How is your health, sir? Please forgive me if I croak. <laughs> I've just had a minor stroke. <laughs> Basal ganglion on the right makes me walk as if I'm tight. So if I fall to groans and croaking, Jamie, you must do the talking. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I'll do what I can. Um, <clears throat> but I want to pursue that slightly longer, not from the medical vantage per se, but when you became ill, uh, the first email I got from you, which was, I guess, shortly before you made the public statement, but similar, it was very similar, you were your invariable self. You were your invariable, rational, curious self. Um, there was nothing about how awful it was or how awful you felt. There was just, well, it's interesting. I'm looking into this, and I'm told this, and I'm not sure about, and it's, I'm going to see, how, I want to see how the, if the brain rewires itself. And <laughs> you took it as, as, as a scientist, as the inveter inveterate curiosity seeker. Well, the basal ganglion doesn't affect higher cognitive functions. And um, I'm delighted to say, and I hope I can bear that out today. Uh, um, but it, it was a bit scary. Um, I found I couldn't use my left hand. I couldn't pick things up, or if I could pick them up, I couldn't let them go again. Um, I was staggering around. I couldn't stand up straight, couldn't go downstairs. Um, my voice started croaking, and it st still is, as you can hear. Uh, I found I couldn't sing, um, which was no great hardship. I don't need to sing for my career. Were you much of a singer before? Or? I sang as a treble in the, in the choir at school, in the chapel, um, sacred music. Uh, and when my voice broke, I could still sing in tune, but I wasn't any good. But now I, I can't even do that. Hmm. Um, I regard it as a kind of litmus test. When I can sing again, I regard, I'll, I'll say I'm completely recovered. And the limit on singing, is that being able to find pitch, or is that a physical limitation in your I think it, voice? I think it's in the voice, yes. I can play an instrument. I can, oh, I can okay. play an instrument by ear, and, and that's not impaired right. at all. What do you play? Well, I, I now play the iwi. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Electronic wind instrument. Um, it's, it's a long thing like a clarinet or an ah, oboe. You okay. stick it in your mouth, and the other end is a wire that goes to a computer and you play it like an oboe or a clarinet, like that. But what comes out of the computer depends on software. So it can sound like a clarinet oh, right. or an oboe or a tuba or a trumpet or a violin or a cello, um, which is wonderful because... You uh, can't play any of those. <laughs> as you know, when you start learning to play the violin, it sounds awful. Right. But when you play it on the iwi, it sounds wonderful. You get, <laughs> you get this perfect sort of high fits vibrato um, and when you tongue it, you go tuk, tuk, tuk. You get the zing of the, of the bow oh, yes, on the, right. on the, on the, the strings. Of the, the attack of the bow. And you just play perfectly the very first time you start playing. It's, Proving we could all use a little post-production. Yeah. <laughs> and one, one more on this. After spending three years writing your memoirs, or more or less, or more, and then sort of after that, or right after that, you have the stroke. And one way or another, did, did either or both together make you, lead you to think a little more about one's mortality? Yes, I suppose so. I mean, um, obviously having a stroke makes you, makes you think that. Um, and uh, writing an autobiography, well, you look back. Um, and uh, the, I mean, I chose to, to write my autobiography when I did, partly because my mother was still alive and still is still alive. She's 99. She's 100 in November. Wow. Um, so she was available for me to ask questions about my early childhood, ah, and yeah. that was wonderful. Um, so yes, I mean, I, 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 
was led to think about mortality. Um, I think what's, if, if there's anything frightening about mortality, it's probably the idea of eternity. And eternity is something, that if it's frightening, you best spend it under a general anesthetic, <laughs> uh, which is what's going to happen to all of us. Um, so I think eternity is only really frightening if you imagine spending, actually living through eternity. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Um, and, and the last on this, I remember is now thinking about those early emails from you. Uh, you sent me a photo of a, like a, a little piece of plastic with a bunch of holes in it in which you had to thread yarn through yes. as a, as a uh, physical therapy task. And I remember you saying something about, uh, you wrote something like, uh, I forget, embarrassed to say how, uh, what, what a sense of accomplishment this yeah. gives me. I was very well treated. I had physical physiotherapy every day for six weeks. A woman came to my house for six weeks, all free on the national health, by the way. <laughs> and and um, occupational therapy, I had to do this stupid threading thing. Yes. And, and, um, I had to do it left-handed, which, which was the problem. Um, I'm still a lot better with my right hand than my left hand. But you're mani you managing to type. Uh, I, I type, remember that was your first real yeah. frustration. I, I can't tweet. I oh, I, I'm not allowed to tweet. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? I didn't. It's bad for the blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we hadn't talked about it. I didn't know. Okay. But, um, well. I, my, my typing, I can still type fast, I can touch type, but left hand is very inaccurate, so I have to go back and correct everything with my right hand afterwards. Oh, interesting, interesting. Not speed, but just accuracy. Yeah. So, um, in a completely different direction, we know that, we kind of know what the big questions are that physicists and astrophysicists are looking at, origin of the universe, the Big Bang, expanding universe. What about remaining questions in biology? What are big questions or a big question in biology that you think we're looking for? The biggest of all, I suppose, has got to be the neurobiology of subjective consciousness, um, which is a deeply mysterious problem. Uh, we all have it. Presumably several other species have it as well. It must have evolved by natural selection. Um, and so it's something about the brain that does it. Um, our most advanced computer programs, which can do things like play chess to grandmaster standards, I don't think anybody thinks they're conscious. Um, but so there, there it is. It's a thing that brains do, and it's a thing that evolution has achieved, and it's a thing that we really don't understand. So, um, and what about, and I think these two questions are related, what about origins of life. I mean, we're still making attempts to recreate life in the lab, as it were, right? The, mo the moments that we jump, yes, from, I mean, we jump from one thing to another. One, once you had genes, once you had um, high fidelity, self-replicating molecules in the world, then natural selection could take off. Right. And we understand pretty much what happened after that uh, in all its glory, in all its wonder. But the very first step the very first production by the laws of chemistry of a self-replicating molecule, something like DNA, not DNA, almost certainly not DNA, because DNA is too complicated and requires protein to work. And you can't get protein, a functional protein, without something like DNA. So um, that first step is still a mystery. It's a mystery that creationists love to jump onto because, because anything, any, any gap in our knowledge is, is, is meat and drink to them, applying as they do the, 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 it, the lack of logic that, that, that they're, they're prone to. Um, it's a, it's a, a, a field where we probably will never know for certain what the answer is. It happened just a bit under, probably a bit under four billion years ago. Um, under very different conditions. It happened through the laws of chemistry, probably in the sea. It might have been deep underground. Um, 
and it was the formation of the first self-replicating molecule, the first molecule that made exact copies of itself, but which had different versions of itself, which is what DNA has. Um, it's no good if it just makes copies of itself. I mean, any old molecule can do that. But if, if there are different kinds of, of, of versions of it, then you've got the possibility of coding. And once you've got coding, then you're, you're, you've made the first step. There also has to be power over the probability that it will be replicated. So there's got to be some difference between this replicator and that in its success at getting itself replicated. And that means power over the world. Once you've got that, then natural selection can get, can get going. We cannot know what happened. We've got various theories now going around. The most fashionable current theory is the RNA world theory. Um, I mentioned earlier that DNA needs protein in order to do, to do its job, and protein needs DNA in order to be made. So we have these, this kind of catch-22, that we have a replicator, which is DNA, and we have an executor, which is protein. How are you going to get, get those, those two, since they each seem to need each other? RNA, unlike DNA, can do the same job as protein, can do the same enzyme job as protein. Not so well as protein, but it can do catalysis of the kind that protein can do. So the theory is that RNA started it all off doing both functions, both the enzyme function of protein and the replication function of DNA. And once natural selection had been going for a while in the RNA world, then the replication function was usurped by DNA and the enzyme function was usurped by protein. So that's a fairly promising theory and it's probably the most fashionable one around at the moment. I don't know how it will ever be resolved, if it ever is. It could be one of those cases where somebody produces a model which is so utterly plausible, so brilliant, that we will all say, as um, John Archibald Wheeler said, looking forward to physics, it will be so obviously beautiful, it's got to be true. Oh, how could we have be all been so stupid? It may be like that. I hope it will be, but it may be we shall never have that closure. I mean, maybe we shall never get that, that satisfaction. Now, I might be wrong about this, but it seems to me that we're, we pursue that question in the laboratory. As close as we might ever get, whether we get there or not, we'll be in the laboratory. Whereas the other question about consciousness seems somehow, is that a, la a lab biology question? Uh, no, no, is the, and we know it is, but is the answer going to be found in, the, in a biology lab or is it going to be found in a computer lab? It might be found, easily found in a computer lab. I mean, that, that I think is a, is a, is a shrewd point. Um, it, it, it's not clear that it'll be only in a, in a biology lab. By the way, um, the, it, it, the origin of life may not be solved in a chemistry lab either because um, this is a slightly specious speculation, but... Um, when you consider that the number of stars in the universe is about 10 to the 22, and probably most of them have got planets, the number of opportunities for life to have evolved in the universe is simply gigantic. If, highly unlikely, but if it only happened once, then the one place where it, had, where it happened had to be here. So it is conceivable that the origin of life on this planet was a quite staggeringly, stupefyingly improbable event. We're allowed, to, we're allowed to postulate that because of the size of the universe and the size of the number of planets and the number of planets that, that there are. Now, if it's that improbable, if it's so improbable that it only happened once, that means that we are not looking for a plausible chemical theory. We're looking for an implausible <laughs> theory. Right. Um, and it, it would mean that chemists are wasting their time trying to repeat this, this origin of life experiment. Now, I don't believe that for a moment. Um, I have to say that because I'm in danger of being misunderstood. But it, it, but it, but it, it, it is a possibility. We, we may not be looking for a very plausible, probable theory. We may be looking for a very improbable theory. But if to counter that, the origin of life in some form or other is commonplace in the universe, which it may very well be, 
and we may never well find out at the same time while it very much will be. But the, just because the origin of life elsewhere is likely, the origin of, but the likelihood of intelligent life may be still stupefyingly, to use exactly. your word, yeah. unlikely. Yes. And I think this is a thing that's often misunderstood. Yes, I agree. Because the chances, the, the role that chance <laughs> plays, not only in the origin of life and in the, in the origin of species, but in the origin of intelligent life and consciousness, may be, or many and, orders of magnitude different. And that's relevant because, because it has to be intelligent life or we won't know about it. <laughs> um, because we can only get radio communication from another, from another planet if, if they're obviously in, intelligent, technological. So you're quite right. We, we need to consider not only the barrier of the origin of life itself, which is a barrier in chemistry, but the barrier of intelligent life. Um, and uh, as you say, it could be that life of a sort of bacterial style is extremely common, um, but intelligent life is rare, or um, the other, other way around. It could be that um, it's, it's highly unlikely that, that life will ever evolve at all on a planet. Once it does, it just runs through to intelligence. Um, that, that in itself is not all that likely, because it's only happened once. Here. Right. It took bet more than three billion years to happen. Yeah. Um, and relating to your early work in, in all of this, in my, in my 20s, I read, I, I fell into a hole of reading. Uh, I think it started with Desmond Morris's The Naked Ape, and then uh, Robert Audrey, and uh, uh, Comrade Lorenz, and there was a whole popular period of that kind of work. Where do we see that work today? Well, Where do you see that work? Those books you're referring to... Territorial uh, Imperative. Yes, ter they, were, they were written in the 1960s, uh, and um, they were very popular. Uh, uh, maybe many people have read them, I don't know. I wasn't in my 20s in the um, 1960s, I just want to... <laughs> <laughs> um, it was really, in, in a way, those books that stimulated me to write my first book, The Selfish Gene, because um, not so much Desmond Morris, but Conrad Lawrence and Robert Ardry mm -hmm. both got evolution totally wrong. I mean, they both um, subscribed to the view that natural selection chooses between groups or chooses between species. Now, if you think that, then immediately you have a facile explanation for altruism, for in Conrad Lawrence's case, for the fact that aggression in animals is tempered and ritualistic, and they seldom go for the jugular, they seldom go for the kill. Um, because a species in which all the individuals are very aggressive goes extinct on that, on that naive group selectionist model. Um, Robert Ardry, the territorial imperative, subscribed to the view that um, territoriality in animals, the spacing out of animals, was in the interest of limiting population right. size. Well, um, limiting population size is a sensible thing to do if you have the welfare of the species at heart. But natural selection doesn't have the welfare of any species at heart. Natural selection has the welfare of individuals and their genes at heart. And limiting population size doesn't, it doesn't satisfy that. Limiting family size does. So individuals are favored in natural selection if they limit their own family size. And that may incidentally have the effect of keeping population size down, but that's not why they do it. They do it to limit family size. Right, the, the alpha pair in a wolf pack will, will prevent other pairs from breeding, which we now think is in relation to the food, the availability yes. of food yeah. in the area. Yes. So th those books stimulated me to, to, to write The Selfish Gene, and, and that caused me to think through exactly how natural selection does work, which is by the differential survival of genes. So the individual, individual organism is to be seen as a machine, a vehicle, for carrying its genes around and propagating them. Surviving as an individual is obviously a requisite to that, those individuals that survive are the ones that pass on the genes that made them survive. So natural selection is about the survival of genes in populations in gene pools. Bodies are the tools, the vehicles by which they do it. Groups are not. I mean, you could, you could try to make a case where, where a group was a tool for them. Right, it's interesting that you point out this. I hadn't thought of it. Lorenz and Audrey, they're really early uh, 
support is of group selection, and exactly. group selection kind of went away for a while, but now is, there are sort of another round of proponents or at least some debate about this. Yes. It's come into the, let's put it this way, it's come back into the conversation yes. uh, by some. Yeah. They just don't understand. <laughs> I mean, you, you've, you've got to think about what it is that actually survives. Now, DNA really, really survives, or it doesn't survive. The difference between successful DNA and unsuccessful DNA is potentially eternal. There are genes in you that have been around for hundreds of millions of years. Um, there are plenty of genes that have fallen by the wayside. The ones that survive are the ones that are good at surviving, and that means good at building bodies that survive and reproduce. The ones that are bad are the ones that build bodies that don't survive and don't, and don't reproduce. But there's got to be a difference between them in the first place. And groups aren't like that. Right. I mean, groups are temporary, they're evanescent, they, they go away. Genes are the only whole, thing. Whole species that, come and go away. Species come and go away. Um, you can occasionally talk about a, a, a sort of selection of species, but it's, it's not, you, couldn't, you would never want to say, this animal has this organ, this eye, this tail, <coughs> this, this feather, as an adaptation to keep the species afloat. No, you never would say that. It's an adaptation right. to help the animal survive, to help it get a mate, to help it rear its child, to help it pass on its genes. And in terms of these early influences, um, I, I'm very interested in the, some of the work of Robert Trivers. He wrote the introduction to the first edition of uh, Selfish Gene, and he wrote a recent memoir called Wildlife. I don't know if you've read that. It's I have suitably, indeed. It's a trip. Right? right? Yeah, that's the right word. Yeah. I mean, it's, talk about a suitable title, right? Yeah. Uh, but he also read, he also wrote uh, Folly of Fools, which is a wonderful book of that sort of posits uh, a science of deception and self-deception. So I, I was curious if you were familiar with all of that and what I, you thought. I think Robert Trivers is one of the most original thinkers in evolutionary biology. Um, he initiated um, the evolutionary study of reciprocation, reciprocal altruism, which is the other main way apart from kinship, but that altruism can come into the world. Um, he initiated a kind of economic thinking in evolutionary theory, both with respect to sexual selection, um, pointing out that the difference between the sexes is primarily an economic one, that the female sex is the valuable sex, the female sex is the one that it's worth fighting for, because the female sex has the, has the uterus, the female sex has the egg, whatever it is in different kinds of animals. So that's why males compete for females rather than the other way around. Um, and he develops this whole theory in a very ingenious and well-written way. He used the same kind of economic ideas, economic reasoning, in talking about parental behavior and parent-offspring conflict, pointing out that um, although superficially the relationship between parent and child is a totally amicable one, actually there's a constant battle going on between parent and child. Um, if you think about a, a species that has a litter of um, m more than one child at, at a time, then um, the, the litter mates are constantly struggling against each other for the economic resources that the parent can give. And the parent is constantly trying to, be, to, to divide it equally. This applies even in those species like ours where we have our children successively because the present child is competing with a future unborn child for the resources that the parent is going to give the unborn child. This shows itself, for example, as Trivers pointed out, in weaning conflict. Um, the present child wants, in quotes, I hope I don't have to constantly say in quotes, wants um, you understand the Darwinian meaning of that. The present child wants to postpone weaning because it's good for the, the present child's survival, but the parent wants to initiate weaning because the parent is also interested in the next child that hasn't yet been born. So this is Trevor's theory of parent-offspring conflict, and he develops it magnificently and applies this same kind of economic theory to sex ratios in social insects and, and wrote a brilliant paper about sex ratios in, in, in social insects. Um, 
And then, as you say, he wrote The Folly of Fools, which is about um, self-deception. He actually introduced the idea of self-deception in the preface to The Selfish Gene, which you, right, which right. you mentioned. But then he didn't develop it further until he wrote this, this book, The Folly of Fools. Yeah. He's, he's a marvelous character. Yeah. And his autobiography is just amazing. <laughs> it's a great story. I mean, he, he gets involved in brawls in, in Jamaica. In, in, he became a, the only white member of the Black Panthers. Um, <laughs> yep, yep. Quite a career. I think he dedicated his memoir to Huey Newton, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And he's, I had the opportunity, uh, Lawrence Krauss does these great debates at ASU. And, he, and a couple of years ago, Lawrence hosted one on deception. And there's, it's a panel discussion, essentially, uh, at ASU. And the only person that was on the panel who, I, who wasn't a, already a friend of mine was, uh, was Trivers. And I very much look forward to getting together, to meeting him. And we ended up spending the night out together, and it was a blast. He, he's, he's a piece of work. Uh, his, his, and the book is great. Um, so... Uh, Let's see. Oh, and while we're talking about science, in a, in a broader sense for skeptics, uh, you know, we're often faced with this idea that some people think that science is a kind of debunking that takes away from fantasy and wonder and, and beauty and just plain fun sometimes. You know, you're, I think it's the first volume of your memoir is titled An Appetite for Wonder, right? So what do you say to people who... What's your answer to that? I mean, we want to educate people about science. Sure, that's easy for us to say, but it's really more than that. We actually want to inspire. Well, of course we do, and, and science is totally wonderful and poetic. Um, I think it's high time a scientist won the Nobel Prize for Literature. <laughs> Let's have a round of applause. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I like the idea of Bob Dylan win, winning the... Nobel Prize. Not sure he does. No. <laughs> but it, it's, it doesn't have to be just novelists and poets. I mean, you can, scientific writing can be poetic and can be, can be of, yeah. of high literary quality. Um, and the study of science should be, should be poetic, should be moving, should be, should be spiritual, one might almost say. Um, think of Carl Sagan, um, think of Lauren Isley, uh, people who, who, who really feel the poetry of science. Um, and dare I say it, even though I, I'm well aware of the great disagreements, and I, and I come down sort of on your side where the disagreements are, but you have to sort of admit that Gould oh, sure, yeah. was a wonderful writer and communicator. Yes, wonderful. Um, so he would have been another, another good, good candidate. Um, some people get turned off science at school. Um, I've heard many people say, I, I, I just, all, all they taught me about was the Bunsen burner. And, <laughs> um, uh, I, sup I mean, it is necessary to, to learn to do science as a practical subject, but there's a kind of philosophy that says science should only be a practical subject. And I think that's a little bit like saying you can't appreciate music right. unless you can play an instrument. So people are put off music because they don't like doing five finger exercises. But you can, I mean, music is wonderful, it's ravishing. You can, you can appreciate music, you listen to right. music. You we teach music as music appreciation. In music without actually playing it. And that's also true of science. And so I'm of the Carl Sagan school of science communication, which, which says, okay, the Bunsen burner has to be done, but look up at the stars, look at the galaxy, look at, look at distant galaxies, look, at, look down a microscope. Um, Think about the age of the Earth. Go to the Grand Canyon and look at, look at the strata. Um, I, don't imagine, I can't imagine any child being bored by that. Yeah, I, I think we should make chemists memorize the periodic table of the elements, but I don't think that's how we should be starting high school students on learning yes. what science means. Yes. I think we do it backwards. Yes. We, don't, we don't teach the scientific method. We teach all this sort of revelation of facts, which is not yeah. counter to the whole, to the whole yeah. point. Um, and I touch upon some of that last night, so let's talk about magic. I think, I'm not going to use the word magic because that, that suggests that it's magic. 
Um, well, we're stuck, well we're, we're stuck with this English word that has all these broad meanings, whereas you, you have a much better word across the pond, which is conjuring. Conjuring. Um, but I do think it's quite philosophically interesting because I, I expect you were all here to see Jamie's act la, la, last well, night. There were um, some folks who didn't, only came in today. But. Okay, well, um, I mean, miracles were performed on stage. <laughs> um, now, we know they were not miracles, but, but that's only because we know that Jamie's honest and he tells us that they're not, they're not miracles. There are frauds out there who do the same kind of tricks not so well and claim that they are miracles, claim that they're so-called paranormal. Now, when you think about the reason why most people are religious believers, it's because of miracles. I mean, Jesus turned water into wine. It'd be child's play for Jamie to turn water into wine. <laughs> that old thing. <laughs> Loaves and fishes. He's walking on water, yeah. Um, so BC. Yeah. <laughs> um, I used to pay lip service to the view that it would be easy to convince me of the existence of God. It would only take uh, some, you know, some voice in the clouds to say in a deep Paul Robeson voice, I am here, <laughs> I am God. Um, and I thought, well, obviously, I would then believe in God. But I'm now not so sure. I mean... <laughs> What, if, you, if we apply Hume's cr criterion, which is more likely, that, it, that it's something supernatural, a miracle, or that there's some, some trickery, if not an, an, an earthly conjurer, some extra planetary conjurer, um, or that I'm hallucinating, or that I'm dreaming, or that I'm drunk, or, or any, any of those sorts of things. I find it rather hard to set out a scenario that would actually convince me that, 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 that God exists. And it's partly because of conjurers that I, that I feel that. But we often ask believers, well, what would convince you? Uh, what would talk you out of your belief? So do we really want to be in this position of well, saying there's nothing that would convince well, me? I, I don't think I want to talk them out of that. I mean, I, I just want them to, to, to admit there is no positive reason for their belief. Right. Um, and... Um, I suppose I'm worrying now because I've said there's no, there could be no positive reason, but um, I don't know. I mean, I, that, that's an idle speculation that, that, that one cannot think of something that really would convi convince one of right. But I, I the think... burning bush wouldn't do it for you. Talking, talking burning bush? <laughs> burning bush is too easy. I, I, I do think, um, <laughs> yeah, the sort of 900-foot Jesus descending out of the clouds, that, that might do it. <laughs> I think I saw that in Doctor Who. <laughs> the first time I think I ever did, you've seen me do magic over a dinner table and at the Magic Castle and other places. Uh, but I think I like to tell the story of the first time, which was at a dinner at Tam, I think. And, we, and then right after dinner, you and, and me and, uh, and uh, Julia Sweeney were standing there, and I did a couple of things, and you said, spontaneously, it, it looks supernatural. And considering the source, I immediately said, can I quote you? <laughs> and at the time we had just met, he went, no. <laughs> but we've laughed about this since, and he's since given me permission. Well, it looks supernatural. <laughs> it, it isn't supernatural, but it does look supernatural. And, and it's, it's, I think it's a salutary lesson. Yeah. Yes, it is a lesson. And that's, and that's actually the lesson that magicians that's the reason magicians have been involved in critical thinking for as yeah. long as there's been a record of it. Uh, I often point to a discovery of witchcraft, 1584, the classic Elizabethan text, which uh, questions the evidence for the witch burnings of James E. in England. And it doesn't say, given that it's 1584, he doesn't say there's no such thing as witches. What he does say is he questions the evidence that was being used at the time to convict yeah. witches. Yeah. To me, that makes him a skeptic. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that um, when the, that um, homeopathy paper was published in Nature, Ben Benist, yes. um, and the editor of Nature then um, engaged the services of Randy and um, a couple of other mm -hmm. people to go and investigate. That's right. Um, so he actually chose a conjurer to go and investigate um, right. this, and from this the claim of... of um, Homeopathic yeah, and at the birth of uh, parapsychological research in the early 20th century, when the 
Scientific American Magazine organized a committee. Harry Houdini was a member of that. And from the time of Harry Houdini to Randy and beyond, magicians are basically always said to scientists, if you're studying, and especially parapsychologists, if you're studying something where deception <laughs> might be involved, you need an expert on deception. All yeah. of the academic training in the world does not make you any more immune to that. I mean, the, the spoon benders notoriously fool scientists. Yes, absolutely. And physicists are the ones who will come up with these elaborate explanations. Yes. There were many at the time. When, when Geller first showed up on the scene, there were yeah. many scientists yeah. who were taken in. and then they, Or the ones who didn't believe, they came up with cockamamie explanations as using special chemicals and heat on the hands and all of this um, because the explanations of of magic are often counterintuitive. Um, talking about this, we've kind of just touched upon the idea of testable claims. Your foundation has combined with, or gone into partnership of some sort with Center for Inquiry. So we have the Dawkins Foundation, which is focused on atheism. We have the Center for Inquiry focused on humanism. We have CSI focused on skepticism. To me, I, well, I've given a number of public talks over the years about not only the overlaps between those movements, but the distinctions between those movements and why I think those distinctions are important. What, what do you think in, in Well, about that? The, the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science. Is more than, much more than atheism, well, yes. Well, it, it, it's called Reason and Science. Right. It doesn't actually say atheism. Right. Um, I, I sit corrected. But, uh, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I suppose it is true that we, that we are in, mostly in favor of atheism. We might, we're also in favor of secularism. I mean, we're strong supporters of openly secular, which um, is, is means to embrace actually secular religious people. I mean, mm -hmm. religious people who feel that there should be separation of church and state. So whereas I, I regard myself as an atheist, and I think most of the people associated with me do, um, it's not in the title of our of our foundation. However, you're, you're trying to Noted. draw a kind of um, three-way three distinction, well, and, well, and I'll, I'll go well, along with it, that. It, right. I mean, it may not apply. Yeah. Fair enough. I, I, the Dawkins Foundation is not a shorthand for atheism, but you are certainly yeah. uh, among the world's most prominent atheist activists. So in talking about these three movements, which is yes. the thing so, I want to talk about, I mean, you gave, the Dawkins Foundation gave an award some years ago to Bill Maher, who No, is, no, we did not. You did uh, not? The, the, the uh, A -A -I, A -A -A -I, Athe Atheist Alliance uh -huh. of America. Oh, I always thought you had given no. an award. Oh, I feel much better um, already. Well, <laughs> the, the award was named after me. That's what it was. Yes. Right. Um, so some anti-vaxxer guy got an award with your name on it. What do you think about that? What, what was the quote we had this morning? Uh, if, uh, if a friend is wrong... Um, <laughs> if a, yeah, I've got it. A friend, if, a, if, a, if, a, if a friend makes a mistake, he remains a friend, and the mistake remains a mistake. There you go. That, that's what it I'm was. good with that. Um, well, um, Bill Maher is wrong about vaccination, but I think he's pretty much right about everything else. And, and no? But, okay. But the question to me, because as, a, as a skeptic activist and as someone who thinks that the skeptic mission is defined by testable claims, by a way of thinking, by a way of thinking as opposed to what to think, uh, about a scientific worldview, I have long argued that I think you can be a believer and a skeptic and a good skeptic, but I don't know that you can be anti-vax and be considered a good skeptic. Well, when you say you can be a believer and a skeptic, um, the reason, I mean, w w you can't actually disprove any of the things that we all uh, go around right. disbelieving. You can't disprove homeopathy, you can't disprove acupuncture, you can't dis disprove graphology and things. All you can say is there is no evidence for them. Uh, there's no evidence that graphology works. Um, it, it, to me, it's actually graphology is very plausible. It just doesn't work. Um, as far as we yet know, but somebody may come along and demonstrate that it does work. Right. Um, homeopathy is a bit of a special case because 
um, the control dose is exactly the same as the experimental dose. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, it, it would be very hard for that to work. Um, you, 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 it, it could. I mean, you can still do it by um, saying you, that all this shaking, yes. succussing. Oh, absolutely. Um, um, and and right. that, is, that is testable. I mean, you could, you could succuss the control as well as succussing the experimental, exactly. which as far as I know has never been done. But setting homeopathy on one side, all, all these other things, just await somebody coming along and demonstrating them. Mm -hmm. And so isn't that the same as God? I mean, God um, is, is undemonstrated. There is no reason for God any more than there's a reason for hobgoblins and fa fairies and um, but the, but while these things are not disprovable, they are all testable. And God is a faith-based is a faith -based well, claim that's not testable. It, it, to me, the difference as a skeptic is if you believe, if you are a believer, on, on a, have a faith-based belief in God, but you have a scientific view of the universe, then, among other things, you're probably making good choices in the world. Uh, so that is different than, um, than saying that you are not only a believer, but you believe that prayer works. Prayer is a testable claim, okay, is a reflection of a belief in God that's not just yeah, faith-based, it's testable. Prayer is testable in, in that you can, you can do an experiment to test prayer in a particular case, and, right, it, can and fail we have. To, it can fail to work. Yeah. Um, but but and, and it, it, it might have worked, but it didn't. Um, well, yeah. well, yes. Well, as Randy always says, if we do a test for flying horses, we haven't proven that horses can ever fly. We've just proven that this bunch of horses that we pushed off the building on this particular day with this yeah. barometric pressure either yeah. couldn't fly or chose not to. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm aware that the, that the skeptical movement which is embodied in this or in this society um, has uh, for a long time been riven by controversy over whether religion should be regarded as a well, victim in well, some way. Well, when, when, when the new atheist, so-called new atheist movement came along and people who identified as skeptics were therefore gladly, gladly welcomed into skeptic circles, but then who then essentially turned around to oversimplify the story, turned around and said, oh, but while we're here, we think atheism is a litmus test for skepticism. And if you're not an atheist, you're not a good skeptic. And I would dispute that. And I would even go so far as to say what I said in the talk that you mentioned this afternoon over lunch, which is overlapping magisteria that's often cited from Tam, that I am willing to entertain the notion that a believer who embraces a scientific worldview is probably doing better for the world on a day-to-day -day basis than a, shall we call it, a faith-based atheist like Bill Maher, an atheist who's not coming from a scientific worldview, who, who's, who's not, who's not making decisions on that basis. I'm willing know, to accept that. I don't know why you single out, why, why you, as it were, give religion a privileged position. I mean, why don't, why don't you say Bill Maher is a skeptic about everything except vaccination? I mean, why, why, why not allow that to be the exception, which... which um, well, it, you know, I, I, we, again, the skeptic movement gets accused of this, of this being a special privilege and trying to avoid certain kinds of controversy, and I would dispute that all the major thought leaders in the skeptic movement from its times of its modern origins and psychop have been, most of them have been outspokenly atheist. I think the focus has, I think it's about the focus on testable claims, and, it, and that's the distinction, and that's what we're trying to teach people about. Again, about, you know, atheism is skepticism of one extraordinary claim. Skepticism is interested in all extraordinary claims. And, but skepticism is not necessarily hammering settled on one answer to those claims. Athe I mean, we, we have to admit that there's a difference between the epistemological question of is there a God or the theological question of is there a God, and we the epistemological question where we are agnostic. We can't prove our... And we're agnostic about homeopathy and everything else for, for, for the same reason. Right, we, but we have a body of evidence of, of, of claims that can be... They're testable. We, 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 have, a, we have a lot of failure to... to, to right, to, to bolster our, yes. our disbelief. Um, now, I, I, I would say the same about religion. Had, had I not shot myself in the foot earlier on by saying that I couldn't imagine... <laughs> 
<laughs> what would... What, what would, you did say something along those lines. What would prove God. But if, if we forget about that and, 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 and go back... <laughs> and go back to the conventional, correct scientific yes. view that, that, that we're, we're all prepared to believe in God if only somebody shows us. Right. Then God becomes exactly like all these other things. We're, we're waiting for evidence. No, but there's a difference between waiting for evidence and having a body of of dis, dis, disabusing evidence. Because that's the difference if it's a testable claim or not. To make the, to make the claim there is no God, a claim I believe in... in no, 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 no we're, I'm not talking about, we're saying there's been a failure to show the evidence that there is a God, just as there's a failure to show that, there's, that, that graphology works. Well, right, but I mean, we don't have... We have lots of you know, refereed journals uh, publishing... Uh, double-blinded replicable results about all of these other paranormal claims. We, because they're not just a random faith-based claim. They're not just a claim in, in God, Spaghetti Monster, or Santa Claus. They are a claim in a, in, in, of, of, of something that exists in, in the world that yes. can be tested. Yeah. I mean, that's, so, so, that's a difference between a testable and a non-testable claim. I don't see how that's well, disputable. In, in principle, the God claim is testable, but... but, but in, uh, yes, yeah, but... Um, yeah. Um, well, testing prayer, testing miracles, right. things. Okay. Yeah, I, I, see, I see where you're coming from. But, uh, um, I just, I, what it comes down to for me is, the, is, the, is this notion that whether you believe in God or not should be the measure of whether you're welcome yes, in the skeptic but, but, world. But, and I think the skeptic movement is about teaching people how to think. Well, and I'm, I think that's the most important thing I think the future of the world lies not in whether or not people believe in God. I, I kind of think like Dan Dennett. You know, Dan, you know what Dan says. Daniel says, it's all going right. Just calm down. Yeah. Right? I mean, right? That's essentially what Dennett says. And I think he's actually right. But the fact of the matter is, when I, say, when I make the statement about the believer who, who embraces a scientific worldview making the world a better place today, what I specifically mean is, is that as a result of the anti-vax movement, as you well know, there's this explosion in cases of preventable disease, measles and mumps and so forth, which has made the world a more dangerous place for my children. So you have a direct link. Bad thinking leads to bad conclusions. Bad acts lead to bad results. To me, that's what skepticism is about. Atheism is a different argument. Well, religion leads to people having their heads no, cut no off. No doubt. And, uh, Yes, no doubt, but, but, it's, but to talk someone in or out of belief in God doesn't necessarily change any of that. Marr is a perfect example. He doesn't believe in God, but he doesn't understand. Well, what you really don't like is the idea that something should be a litmus test and that, and that somebody who believes in God should be, as it were, thrown out of the door. Um, and yet you're throwing Bill Maher out of the door um, because, of, because of one... Well, um, for the reason I said, that yes. I think you can be... Uh, yes, I'm willing to say... You can, I think you can be a believer and in God and embrace a scientific worldview. And I don't think you can be, and therefore be, a, be called a skeptic in, in the reasonable, meaningful sense that affects the world. Uh, and I don't think you can be an anti vaxxer and make those claims. I think, I think it's sort of fundamental. I think it's an anti science, a fundamentally anti science position to be anti vax. Yeah, well, I, th I think you're right there, but, but um, I, I, I think Bill Maher does a good job in all sorts of other respects, and, and, and I'm glad he's around. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. We'll, uh, we'll, agree, to, we'll agree to disagree. Uh, I don't know if, you'd want, if you care to comment on any of this, but uh, considering the uh, date on the calendar and the newspapers and Brexit... Uh, on your side of the pond, and the upcoming presidential elections. Do you have uh, any comment about any of that even, that you'd like to make, or I, even if it's... I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Well, um, I am ashamed to be English. I'm not ashamed to be British. I'd be proud to be Scottish or Irish. <laughs> I'm ashamed to be English um, because the Brexit vote was largely motivated by xenophobia, yeah. a petty, small-minded, insular 
xenophobia. But the vote should never have happened in the first place. That's the main thing. David Cameron is a total idiot to have, <laughs> to have. I could just about imagine making a case for a referendum on a particular issue like fox hunting, something like that. To have a referendum among the entire electorate on something as economically complicated, politically sophisticated as membership of the European Union, the vast majority of the British public haven't the faintest idea what they were voting about. Right. Typical reasons for voting to leave the European Union were, oh, well, it's nice to have a change. <laughs> or, well, I prefer the old blue passport to the modern purple passport. <laughs> People, we, 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 we live, we both live in, in representative democracies. We have members of parliament, you have members of Congress, whose job it is to take decisions with advice from civil servants on complicated issues like, um, such, such, such as the membership of the economic, well, the European Union is. When you isolate one thing like, like one major thing like membership of the European Union, hundreds of other things, ramifications, consequences follow from that that the, the voters have no idea about. The, if, if in proper cabinet government, the civil servants say, oh, minister, if you do this, then don't you realize that'll have that effect? Mm -hmm. And if you have that, that'll have that effect. These are very, very complicated issues. It's a major constitutional change. In the United States, in order to change the Constitution, to amend the Constitution. You need a two-thirds majority in both houses, and I think it has to be ratified by all the state um, legislatures. As, 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 uh, three quarters. Three, three quarters. Um, we had a referendum on a major constitution, a major constitutional change which is going to affect us for decades to come. This is not like a, in five years, four years' time, there'll be right. another election. With a simple this is, majority vote. This is the decade, a simple majority vote. The polls were going up and down like this, zigzagging up and down, the polling day just happened to blip above the 50% mark. This, this is an outrage, it's a scandal. Now, um, in this country, um, I, I worry about um, the fact that out of a population of 300 million, whatever it is, um, what rises to the top, what rises to the, to the top of the, of the electoral um, ballot is Donald Trump. Um, and, and I mean, George Bush, I mean, admitted he, he never won an election, but, but nevertheless, um, he, 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 he became the Republican um, nominee. Um, it cannot be the case that in this population of highly talented people, the best candidate to lead the country is George W. Bush, or Donald Trump, or even Hillary Clinton. Um, when you want to choose the head of a major company, like IBM or General Motors, you go into a, a, a major search. You look at, you search for the best person for the job. You look at, you take up references, you interview, you, 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 you study their record, you, you look at, all the, all the details that, that qualify the various candidates for the job. When we look for a new professor in our university, we set up a committee. The committee reads their publications, reads their books, reads their papers, interviews them, takes up references, takes soundings. When you fly in, a, in an airliner, you have a pilot who is highly qualified, who's passed exams, who knows how to fly a plane. When you have an operation, your, your surgeon has been trained for, what, 10 years, passed ex exam after exam, done enormous amount of training. And yet, to become president of the United States, you need to ha have no qualifications whatsoever. All you need to do is get votes. And, and there are people who are opposed to the building of those qualifications every time there's a, a movement uh, about uh, term limits. Term limits is a... Yeah. is a limiting of, of the building of the resume you propose. 
Yes. I mean, not to get awash in that I mean, issue, but... It, 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 it's not deeply undemocratic to suggest that you should make some kind of a bar that they have to jump over. We already have an age bar. Um, we have a bar, you have to be born in this country. What's that about? I mean, why do you have to be born in this country? Um, but you, you have to be born in this country, but you don't have to have any qualifications whatsoever. Uh, you don't even, I think, have to be vetted by the Secret Service to make sure you're not a spy. Um, all you need to do is get votes. And we're seeing in this election how distressingly easy it is for a truly revolting human being to get votes. Well, yeah. I don't... I don't know that the answer is, is to uh, make restrictions, put restrictions on how and who can become president. And I think, I mean, Trump got to where he is in this situation through a series of unforeseen circumstances, even by his very own party, uh, having to do with differences in the way the primary system works and so forth. But to, to stand back just a little bit, the Brex, Brexit and Trump, you mentioned is the role of xenophobia in the Brexit vote. And what I find disturbing, taking a small step back, you know, Trump has given essentially permission, he's given validation to people whose views have been hiding in the corners, in the dark Very corners in so. this country Very much so. since the days of Lyndon Johnson and the Civil Rights Act. Uh, and you could no longer speak, spout racist hatred. Yeah. Uh, but, in but Trump's, Trump's validated he's that. He's validated yeah. and he's brought those people out and I, and I see that as a lasting impact. That's not going to go away yeah. even if he loses the election. I agree, I agree. And I see Brexit as a reflection of the same thing which concerns me about those voices in Europe as well. I totally agree. I mean, um, in, in, the, in the very days after the Brexit vote, there were, there were people attacking Polish people in, in, in Britain. We voted for you to go. Why are you still here? I mean, you, they actually got that, yeah. that kind of thing. Awful. I mean, that, that, that's utterly revolting. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, I'm going to sort of, I'm going to ask you this. So um, if you had to make a choice, uh, you've, hopefully you've still got plenty of time, but you, we, we talked about it in the beginning, thinking about mortality and so forth. Uh, and you've written three volumes of your memoirs. If you had to make a choice, and we don't get to make a choice, but if you had to make a choice, would you prefer to be remembered for your scientific work, uh, for your atheist activism work, or for your work as a science educator for the public? I think perhaps science educator. Um, I... In, I've written about 12 books, um, and most of them are about science. Um, and uh, I do care passionately about science, not because it's useful, although it is, uh, but because to go to your grave without understanding why you were here in the first place is a tragedy. And now, in the beginning of the 21st century, we know so much. We don't know everything. There's a lot more to learn, and that's exciting in itself. We know so much. It's a wonderful thing to be able to tell children what the world is, what the universe is, what the process that gives rise to life, the process that gave rise to them. This is a privilege of the time in which we live, the century in which we live, which was not granted to previous centuries. And so I think um, my role as a science educator um, probably comes first. I mean, my, my contribution to science, I suppose, it, the, the, the selfish gene and the extended phenotype are somewhere between science education mm -hmm. and science. They are... Um, uh, perhaps a somewhat different way of looking at existing science. So they're, they're not the product of my own laboratory research. They're perhaps turning existing orthodoxy on its head a bit and seeing it in a different way. Um, so I think that is a sort of contribution to science. The atheist activism, I don't see it as very separate. 
um, this may come back to our earlier argument. I mean, I, I, I think it's, um, I, I, I see theism as an erroneous scientific hypothesis. Um, and so I think it's part of science to oppose it. Uh, I, I don't regard it as, as I, I don't have any truck with separate magisteria. I mean, I, I, um, I, I, I do think that, that we are in active competition with, with religious faith. So I don't think, that I, although The God Delusion appears to be a rather different book from my science books, I think it's actually not, not all that separate. And speaking to, to that, exactly to that, do you have conversations with scientists much about they're encouraging them to, to speak out more about such issues? I mean, scientists are notoriously loath to speak out about such issues. I wish they would, I must say. Um, the, the, the evidence um, from elite scientists, at least, that's to say members of the National Academy of Sciences in this country and fellows of the Royal Society right. in Britain, um, the evidence is that about 90% of them are non-believers. Right. Um, and they don't, on the whole, bother to come out and say much about that. And I wish they would. Um, if you actually, if you're in a gathering of scientists, either in Britain or America, you can just you can you can safely assume that they're all atheists. Yes. You don't you don't yeah, have to sure. you don't yeah. have to dissemble. You don't have to be bend over backwards to, to sure. be polite. It's just taken for granted. And if you say why do you keep quiet about it? They, they will say, well, I've just got better things to do. I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm busy in the lab. Um, and yeah, there's a lot in that, of course. Right. But um, I, I do feel a, a bit sort of exposed sometimes, a bit, a bit um, out, out on a limb. Right, I'm sh uh, yeah, I'm sure you do. And, but what about, even atheism as a side, what about talking to other scientists about how to speak to the public about science and speaking more to the public about science? I mean, popularism, being a popularizer has been an epithet within the scientific community for years. Sagan especially got hit with it. He was denied membership of the National Academy almost certainly because, because he was a popularizer. Um, I have been elected a fellow of the Royal Society, I'm glad to say, and I'm, I'm delighted and, pr and proud of that. Um, so I, I haven't myself suffered from the Sagan effect. Right. Um, but, <clears throat> and I think there's less and less snobbishness mm -hmm. uh, in the scientific community ag against people who write books for the general public. Right. I've, Still, there's this thing about you know doing science, some people doing science, and then moving on to public education about science or speaking out or whatever, and you still get that kind. Of, I, I see it. I'm not just talking about you here. Uh, you know, yeah. well, you yes. see it in other friends and colleagues. Moving into philosophy is worse, isn't it? It's, 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 it's this thing called the philosophers. <laughs> <laughs> well, and speaking of philosophy, there's been a lot about. Uh, sort of scientists, some science popularizers, dismissing the validity of philosophy. There's been some noise about that in the last couple of years. I've, I've come across that. Um, <laughs> uh, are you thinking of Lewis Wolpert? Um, yeah, and, well, and uh, Lawrence. Lawrence got Krauss, yes. Some of this. Um, I do. Seems like you're all happy yeah, to talk to Dan I, Bennett, I, but I don't know about. I, 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 there are certain philosophers that I, that I like. <laughs> um, I do wonder a bit about, I mean, I, I, I have arguments sometimes with an English philosopher who, who, who regards philosophy as what you can do from an armchair as opposed to in the lab or in the field. And when you, when you challenge him to think of a, of a question which, can be, which, which only philosophy can answer, he gives the, the paradox of why mirrors reverse left, right rather than up, down. Well, I think that's A, trivial, and B, a problem in physics. Yeah, I agree. With you. Um, yeah. Uh, but um, I am, well, I think historically about my own subject of evolution by natural selection, um, this intensely powerful idea, yet very, very simple idea, had to wait till the mid-19th century before we thought of it. Darwin and Wallace 
independently thought of it, and arguably Patrick Matthew as well. Uh, Darwin and Wallace were both traveling naturalists who knew an awful lot about animals and plants. But what they did could have been done from an armchair. Why didn't Aristotle get it? Why didn't Hume get it? Um, why, why didn't all the philosophers down the ages get this startlingly simple yet powerful idea? It must be one of the most powerful ideas ever because right. if you measure the power of a theory by what it explains divided by what it needs to assume in order to do the explaining. I mean, it's, it's, it's colossal. It explains everything about life, the diversity of life, the illusion of design of life, the beauty of life. And what, and what it, the, the theory itself is just devastatingly simple. Yet nobody got it until Darwin and Wallace in the uh, 1850s. And you, your proposed answer to this, why? Well, I think philosophers let us down. I mean, they should have got it. <laughs> uh, why didn't they? Right. And um, I've never asked you this, but uh, I've often thought of it. And why do you think Darwin waited so long? There are various possible reasons that have been suggested. Um, he may have been afraid of the religious backlash, uh, in particular from his wife. That, that's, a, that's one possibility. Um, he, it, it may be that he was just ex extremely fastidious about getting all his ducks in a row, about getting all the evidence assembled. Um, he, he was working <clears throat> on a massive book, which was to be called Natural Selection, and he was amassing evidence for it. Um, and he was <coughs> precipitated into writing The Origin of Species, which he called the abstract of his big book, um, by the fact that Wallace got there independently. Um, so maybe he, he, he was just waiting. I mean, I, I'm astonished that Darwin didn't fear being scooped because right. it's such a powerful idea. When he, he, he got the idea in the 1840s, why didn't he think, oh, I've got to better publish this quickly? Yeah, so when um, we talk about the, you say, you, you phrase it as afraid <laughs> of the religious backlash, but I, and you do mention his wife. I, I think of it as the other way, that it was not so much afraid of the external political backlash, whatever, but almost as a, perhaps a kindness to his wife, right? That he didn't, yes, like a very possible. personal view, yeah. not a larger yeah. political reason, but a very personal reason. Do you think that's yes. possible? I think it's possible. He may have been reluctant. He, his, his sketch of the eight, early 1840s, which was quite long, I mean, several, 100 pages or so, um, he, he left it with instructions to his wife asking her to publish it in the event of his death. Um, but I think that you've got a good point there. It, 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 it may have been that. He, I mean, much of the time he spent studying the taxonomy of barnacles, which was worthwhile work, but, but not in the same league as, as the origin of species. Right. And, um, so I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's true that when the origin came out, um, he, he re retreated to, to the country and didn't take part in much of the de debate. He left that to Hooker and Huxley and others. Um, so he was not a pugnacious character. He was a gentle, gentle Yeah, man. gentle, gracious. Right, exactly. Yeah. That's, that's why I always wonder about that. And maybe it was as yeah. simple as answer as a marriage. Maybe, an interesting, yeah, an interesting idea. I mean, there, I mean his, his, there was some grief about it, about the, the, the fact that his wife was religious and, yes. and, and you know, feared that, 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 that she would lose him in the afterlife. Yeah. Um, in these larger issues about science and, uh, and <laughs> scientific view of the world and th things that skeptics have to deal with all the time, you're sometimes faced with things like, well, there are some things science just can't solve. What, what do you say to that? Well, um, f firstly, if, if there are some things that science can't solve, then nothing can solve them. Um, it, certainly not religion, anyway. Uh, That, that I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it seems to me that what you, what, what you mean there is you, when you're talking about social issues. Oh, no, no. I, I, issues I, of I, social or, consequence. Or moral issues. No, I, I didn't mean that. I meant, I, I thought when you said there are some things science can't solve, right. you meant questions about the real world, about the natural world. Like, for, for example, um, so, the, the origin right. of the laws of physics. Where do the right. laws of physics come from? Right. 
Um, where, do the, where, the, where do the fundamental constants of physics come from? These, these numbers which have a value which physicists can measure, but they can't explain. Um, maybe science can never explain them. It was that kind of thing I meant when I said, uh -huh. well, if science can't, right. then nothing right. can. Right, right, right. But those are questions about the natural universe. But y yes. basically, your position would be that there is no question about the natural universe that can't in no, theory, no, be solved. No, well, no. There, there may be questions that science can't solve. But All I said was that will. nothing else will. Nothing else will. And I think it's an open question whether science will solve them. And, and um, there are some physicists who, I say physicists because this is where it's really going to be. Um, there are some physicists who think that physics will be an endless quest. There'll always be something else over the next hill. There are other physicists who think that um, physics will come to an end will reach a kind of quietus. Uh, and I find both prospects equally exciting, actually. I mean, I, I, I like the idea of either of those things. I like the idea of a general, of a grand universal theory, which, which yes. you know, everything is solved. That would be great. But I also like the idea that physics is going to go on and on and on. Um, biology will go on anyway because of all the details that, that need to be solved. Right, coming back to what we were talking about, yeah. about great mysteries of science. But it, that is, there is that striking issue about evolution by natural selection being the unified field theory of biology and, and physicists' endless search for some equivalent which is yet to make itself yes, the, known. Yes, the equivalence is, is a difficult one. It's not, it's not right, a Right, it's not a literal no, equivalence. No, no. But, but you do, as a biologist, you do have an overarching theory that speaks to everything about biology. You can't, there's, yes. there's no cell you can put under a microscope that wasn't affected by that is evolution true. by natural no, that, selection. That is true. I mean, physics, I suppose, has two overarching theories, which are at present needing to be brought together, and, and, uh, and so far are not. I mean, relativity and quantum theory. Right, relativity and, 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 and quantum. Um, did you ever... Talking about Darwin and his barnacles, were you ever? Was there ever a time when you were tempted to uh, do that kind of biological field work? Wild, look at wildlife in the wild. Or? I love looking at wildlife in the in the wild. I'm not. I don't have the same meticulous um, attention to detail that Darwin had with his barnacles. I'd, I'd be hopeless at that kind of thing. <laughs> do you have any particular? Are you given to any particular species that you're fond of or fascinated by, or? I have sponsored for the One Zoom Taxonomy Project, um, Vero Sifaka, which is a lemur in Uganda which da dances on its hind legs, which I love. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, what's the species again? Vero Sifaka. Ah, okay. Oh, the Sifaka. Yes, of yes. course. Yes. I'm told well, that. Well, a lot of those. No, no, I'm serious. No, but a lot of those lemurs and prosimians, they're fascinating. They are, the eye yeah. eye and all, yes, of, all yes. of the Sifakas. Somebody, somebody told me the correct pronunciation of Sifaka is actually Shifaka. Oh, it's got right. Yeah. Um, now, I, but I, I mentioned one zoom. The, the, I'm the, not what, touching that. <laughs> um, can I just plug it a bit? Please. Um, uh, my colleague uh, Ian Wong, who is the joint author of the second edition of the Ancestors' Tale, mm -hmm. has been working together with um, James Rosendell. In, who, in, in, in Britain to produce a truly magnificent computer program to show the taxonomy of all life. Now, the taxonomy of, I mean, there are about uh, maybe as many as 10 million species of living things. And if you were to try to, I mean, they, they all must fall on one family tree. There's, a, there's one family tree of all life. But if you were to try to draw that family tree on a piece of paper such that you could read the labels, then the, the piece of paper would reach from here to the orbit of Jupiter, or something like that, right. I exact calculation. So the only way to draw it is as a fractal. You, so you have in the computer the entire tree, and you rove around it like Google Earth, and you zoom in, you drill down to particular, to particular places. And so it, it, it looks like the Mandelbrot set, it, lo it looks like um, a a beautiful fractal picture. And you can find your way to any animal or plant you like um, by drilling down in the appropriate place. What you've, you won't necessarily find the animal you're looking for because not all of them have been put on yet, but the, the, the twigs are there waiting for them to, to be put on. Um, and so 
he, they're asking people to sponsor species. To, and so you get your name on the, on the, right. um, on the um, species. So I, I've got my name on Vera Shifaka. Uh, um, <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> I, I'm kind of, that's a plug, okay? Yeah, we got it. The name is One Zoom, O N E Z O O M. One Zoom. One Zoom. And your interest in those kinds of animals, uh, uh, I, I always, one of the things I find interesting about that, you know, there are people who want to go to the zoo and look at gorillas and chimpanzees and orangutans and see themselves in them. That's never. It's not of particular interest to me, even though I have a strong background in wildlife. I love, I almost ended up in that line of work at one time in my life. And, uh, <clears throat> but when you're looking at these odd persimians, and most of whom are confined to Madagascar, you're sort of looking at the weird, freaky old ancestors that we don't really think of, that the average person doesn't yeah. think of, right? Little insectivorous, I'm you not know. sure you think of them. I mean, it probably might be better to think of them, not so much as ancestors, as, as the... the what happened when early prosimians got isolated on Madagascar right. and produced a, a, a and great, speciated a, a great out flowering from that, of, of species? From that isolation, because there were there were lemurs. I mean, they're all lemurs in Madagascar, right. and um, but I mean, they they range from Vera Shifaka, which does this wonderful dance, to Indries, which which do these spectacular leaps. They're quite big creatures, spectacular yeah. leaps from you know, the treetops. There was a there was a lemur which unfortunately is now extinct, which was as big as a gorilla. I think actually bigger than a gorilla. Um, so lemurs are, are wonderful things, and they go down to mouse size as, as well. Um, there are prosimians elsewhere in the world, like tarsiers. Uh, tarsiers and, and, and uh, uh, lorises. Lorises, yes. Right. Slow loris yeah. and slender loris. Yes. And, but, so if we were to go back in the common ancestor before Madagascar gets isolated, we are looking at something that's sort of like some insectivorous yes, it would creature be an, at that some, point on the tree. Something like, like an early lemur or a, or a tarsia or a loris, something like that. And then when Madagascar got separated off, in, 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 in Africa they, they became monkeys and in Madagascar they became lemurs. Right, right. And, old, and then old world monkeys separated to new world monkeys. and those New world monkeys probably got, got to the new world by island hopping. We remember that South America and Africa were, were close and, right. and gradually drifted apart. So. Right, right. And, and the key, one of those key differences being prehensile tails. Prehensile tails are very common in South America, not just in monkeys, oddly enough. Maybe, I don't know, something about the weather in South America, something odd about South America that, that favors prehensile tails. I don't know what that could be. <laughs> or it may just be chance. Almost certainly is just chance. Well, who wouldn't want one, though? <laughs> Quite. <laughs> well, a, a strange man is creeping up on us, and uh, I think he's trying to draw our attention to um, the clock. It is uh, such a joy to have this public conversation with you, as well as every private conversation I've ever had with you. Um, just a, a mind like no other. And uh, I, I guess I, I don't usually like to comment. I, I, I just do these things and let people draw their own conclusions. And I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going, I'm, I'm struck by saying it. I, one of the things that troubles me about some of the people I know, I'm fortunate enough to know, especially through the skeptic world, uh, is uh, people construct these sort of, uh, Characters, these 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 personas of public figures that are often very different than the real thing, and uh, I, I just have to tell you, there's there's I, I can't think of anyone uh, I can spend a more pleasant uh, lunch with than uh, than this guy, and it, I hear people when I'm confronted with people who like knew I was about to do this or something and would ask me, and they have all sorts of nutty ideas about the public persona of people like Richard or Randy. I went through it my whole life with Randy as well. And uh, this is just one of the gentlest, uh, kindest, and, uh, and quick to laugh uh, guys I know. And it's, it's just a pleasure to share this time with you. Thank you so, so much. So thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.